Berlin, March 2017. Three hooded men walk down a train station platform on their way to a spectacular nighttime heist. Their target, a giant gold coin. They entered directly via a window. Dresden, 2019. Two men break into a historic collection of royal jewelry and steal a priceless hoard of centuries-old artifacts. In both cases, we have to assume that the perpetrators were interested solely in the material value. The task of retrieving stolen ark treasures can involve paying a substantial ransom. They have the valuables and we have the money. They want the money, we want the valuables. Little risk, big reward. Museums are being repeatedly targeted by thieves who lack a conscience. If I steal something, I don't feel ashamed. I don't, uh, I don't even apologize. Dresden in Eastern Germany. In the heart of the city's historic center lies the Residenzschloss. For almost four centuries, it symbolized the power and wealth of Saxon royalty. Stefan Koldehoff is a journalist specializing in art crime and is familiar with the precious artifacts stored here in one of Europe's most renowned collections. This palace was a residence for electors and kings, including Augustus the Strong, and it also housed a treasury. So it was a place of both political and cultural activity, with an incredibly valuable collection of items. Today, the palace is a museum, its treasures now belonging to the public rather than a prince. It's one of Germany's most popular art collections, attracting around 700,000 visitors every year. In November 2019, it hit the headlines when the famous Green Vault was the scene of the biggest art heist in Germany's history. Evidently, the thieves removed three of these diamond-shaped metal bars in advance using a hydraulic cutter and then temporarily put them back in place. This was a day or two before the actual theft. The bars had been reattached using just glue, so it was easy to remove them on the night itself. The palace, including the green vault, is open to the public. While scouting the area beforehand, the burglars identified a weak spot, the windows on the ground floor. When they returned in the early hours of November 25, 2019, all they had to do was remove the previously detached metal grill and break open the window behind it. Once inside, the thieves had free reign of the green vault and its priceless contents. We're right by the window where the thieves broke in. Outside is the grill that they cut apart, giving them direct access to the treasury chamber. It's believed that two thieves entered the green vault through the window. The treasures there have been on display ever since Augustus the Strong opened his collection to visitors in 1724. This is the Hall of Treasurers, which again shows the diverse range of items collected by the monarchs back then. But the thieves weren't interested in nautilus goblets or ostrich eggs. They quickly passed through this room on their way to the jewelry room. The thieves came prepared. They knew exactly which route to take, making their way through the coat of arms room before arriving at their destination, the jewelry room. Working against the clock, they broke through the display case with an axe. Housed in the jewelry room are sets of jewels, matching stones commissioned by Augustus the Strong, now missing quite a few pieces. These display cases contain priceless pearls and jewellery belonging to Saxon monarchs, which they collected both for their own prestige and as an investment. And this is what the thieves were after. Thieves 
following safety protocol, security guards called police, but did not intervene. In minutes, the thieves smashed through the display case and grabbed 22 items. The burglars disappeared into the night, and with them, priceless pieces of history. Regardless of their value in gold or diamonds, they can never be recreated. You won't have the same aura or the same pieces that Augustus the Strong might have held in his hand. Belt buckles, swords, brooches and buttons, donned by kings and adorned by figures throughout history, their worth far greater than their material value. Marianne Ackerman is the director of Dresden State Art Collections. Her job involves two distinct responsibilities, both protecting the collection and presenting it to the public. The ultimate question is how far do we go in terms of security? How many more millions do we need to invest? And of course, these are issues that concern our colleagues everywhere, not just in Germany. The break-in at the Green Vault and the loss of important historical artifacts weighs heavily on Ackermann. We're confident that it will be returned to us, or parts of it at least. Past cases suggest it might take quite a while, but the main thing is to keep on hoping. 4,300 diamonds were stolen in the Dresden heist, a high-profile case involving three prosecutors and 40 special investigators. Travemund on the Baltic Sea. Here, private investigator Josef Resch is taking an unconventional approach to getting the treasures back, negotiating directly with the thieves. They have the valuables and we have the money. They want the money, we want the valuables. Shortly after the robbery, he posted this video online, offering a reward of over 1 million euros for the return of the Dresden jewels. This money is exclusively for returning the jewels intact, with a guaranteed payout. Eventually, the reward grew to 5 million euros, provided by an anonymous art collector. This is someone who appreciates art, it's a hobby of theirs, and they want to see these valuables back where they belong in the museum in Dresden. The private investigator says his job was to find the jewels, not the thieves. Doing business with criminals is usually frowned upon. Offering 5 million euros to buy back stolen goods could be seen by some as unethical. They did what you don't do, a burglary, property damage, they stole valuable things. And because there were more than three, it's a gang theft. That's all it is. There's no life sentence or anything. So I think that's morally defensible. Less than a year after the heist, his plan seemed to be working. Resch says he was contacted by the thieves looking to return the jewels. The handovers are pretty much sorted. I can't say, but given the negotiations and my own experience, things are looking up. In November 2020, Resch was confident the Dresden jewels would soon return. A ransom for stolen art treasures, in the form of a table stocked with cash, was a new concept for Stefan Koldehoff too. A private sector bid like this is rare and surprising. Normally the thieves will contact the aggrieved party about an offer. But someone going public, literally putting money on the table, is pretty unusual. And that's because of the unique nature of the Saxon royal treasury. Koldehoff has spent years writing about art crime. Germany alone sees an average of four works stolen every day. 
One factor, he says, is that art is becoming increasingly expensive and lucrative. There's never been so much money in the art market. As gallery owners and auction houses will tell you, when banks offer zero interest and you already have enough villas and yachts and pricey watches, having a Banksy or a Van Gogh or Gerhard Richter on the wall becomes a status symbol. And that's something people with enough money are willing to pay a lot of money for. Eager art investors can be found at events like Art Basel. The fair brings together the worlds of art and finance, with wheeling and dealing conducted over champagne and oysters. This is your typical Basel crowd. The art here ranges from classical modern to contemporary, so that attracts young and old collectors. The week-long Art Basel Fair features paintings, sculptures and photos from around 270 galleries. Among them, this work by influential American artist Jean-Michel Basquiat. This is priced at $40 million. There have been Basquiat's that cost a lot more money than this, some larger in size. But for this one, $40 million is set in stone. New York-born Jean-Michel Basquiat was the first black artist to break into the otherwise white-dominated Western art market. Prices for his works have risen dramatically since he died at just 27 in 1988. This is a smaller work that went for the asking price of $3 million in the first day. Some works are subject to aggressive competition. When some collectors know a piece like this will be on show in Basel, they are determined to turn up right when the fair opens. Because the second it's on the wall, it's on sale. First come, first serve. And those commercial forces seem to know no bounds. In 2019, global art market sales topped 57 billion euros. There are a range of factors behind the continuous growth in investment, low interest rates, a real estate slump, and the risky nature of the stock market. During the initial boom in the 1990s, it was primarily Japanese buyers snapping up everything at galleries and auctions. But they all sold after the real estate bubble burst back home. And after a brief lull, prices shot up again with the emergence of new buyer markets. After the fall of communism, you had a lot of very rich Russians in the Yeltsin era discovering the art market. The opening up of China also generated a lot of extremely well-funded collectors, and that new boom never really ended. A boom that does not only attract legitimate collectors and investors. As elsewhere, where there's money to be made, there's criminal activity. Amelie Ebbinghaus works for the world's largest private database of looted art and antiques. Her job is to track down and recover works that have been stolen. I can't provide specific figures, but there must be two to 5,000 works on show here, and the chances of there being nothing here deserving a closer look are extremely slim. Ebbinghaus is an art historian specializing in the origin of artworks and other cultural assets. A large number of stolen works do end up back on the art market. At art fairs, we often encounter classic theft, where most exhibitors genuinely believe they have a legitimate work until we say, sorry, but this was stolen 10 or 15 years ago. And that happens with both old paintings and works from the 1960s or 80s. Ebbinghaus and her colleagues at Art Loss Register scour all the major fairs for stolen merchandise and make regular catches. Any paintings, sculptures and photos up for sale at such events first have to have their origin and history verified. I've had cases of people screaming at me for half an hour because we found something. It can be awkward, 
But ultimately, the fair organizers say they don't want anything that shouldn't be on sale here for legal or ethical reasons. And exhibitors have to comply. Every year, Art Loss Register solves around 200 cases of stolen art. Art thieves often face a major problem. While their haul is extremely valuable, it is often unsellable. So why do criminals continue to target museums and galleries? Unfortunately, the immediate reason is utterly banal and at the same time shocking, just because they can do it. Criminals can tell how poor the security is at public collections. A lot of them only think later about what to do with their hall and then wonder how they're going to be able to get rid of it. So they have to approach the owner demanding a ransom, what's called art napping. And that's exactly what happened at an internationally renowned Frankfurt Gallery in 1994. The Schoen Kunsthalle enjoys frequent collaborations with the likes of the Pompidou Center and New York's Museum of Modern Art. At the time, it was featuring two works by English painter William Turner, Shade and Darkness and Light and Colors. The thieves locked themselves inside. The Shin had decided not to have surveillance cameras for financial reasons, believing it could ensure security using other options. With the building deserted, they overpowered the guards and tied them up. After removing the art from the wall, they fled via a side exit in the direction of the cathedral, before driving off in a van. After eventually being able to free themselves, the guards triggered the alarm. And then you had, as always, police investigators at the crime scene wondering who could be responsible. News of the theft was met with shock in Germany, Britain and across the international art scene as images of the empty walls were published. Frankfurt police launched a criminal investigation. Over in London, the disappearance of the two Turners left the British art world stunned. They'd been on loan from the city's Tate Gallery, one of the world's major collections of modern and British art. At the time, Sandy Nairn was the Tate's director of programs. The 29th of July, 1994, that, is, that date is <laughs> always in my mind, and it was Nicholas Sorota, the director of Tate, and he said, we have this terrible news from Frankfurt. And I realized I was only just awake. It was very early in the morning. I couldn't, it was very hard to take in what he was saying, but he explained that the news had come, that these two paintings had been stolen from the Schoen Kunsthalle. Three years later, two members of the Yugoslav Mafia were convicted for the Schoen break-in, each sentenced to several years in jail. The paintings themselves, however, remained at large. The works in question are beloved in Britain. Their English creator, Joseph Mallard William Turner, is considered his country's foremost painter of the Romantic era. His style of depicting the elements of fire, water and light is still today considered revolutionary. It is quite difficult to say how important J.M.W. Turner is to the idea of British painting. He is the kind of way of thinking of British painting becoming something. I mean, there were artists before Turner, but really he changes the whole of British art. And he, at the end of his life, he himself decided to make a collection of particular paintings to give to the nation. Nairn and his colleagues from the Tate did all they could to track down the two works. He made repeated trips to Germany to talk to authorities, while also holding press conferences on the painting's possible whereabouts. Five years after the theft, an attorney who had contacts within the Frankfurt criminal community reached out. And he said, I have important information. I have information from people who know where the paintings are. So of course we were very suspicious. We said, you know, 
How do you have information? What is this information? We'd had many, many false leads. I mean, one of the things that emerged was a sense that criminality leads to more criminality. The Tate Gallery resorted to negotiating with the criminals. It took until the year 2000 and two and a half million euros for the deal to proceed. Nairn flew to Frankfurt and took art expert Roy Perry with him. He had to know that it was the painting. I mean, what if it had been a copy? What if it had been a fake had been brought back? And so it was crucial that I could say to Roy Perry, you must examine this first. And he had the right records, he had the right photographs, but he looked at it and we all waited. <laughs> and then he said, uh, he said uh, it's like meeting an old friend. And he knew that was the Turner. In total, the Tate spent around 4 million euros to recover the paintings. But the strategy of doing business with criminals would prove problematic. When an art snapping job like this works, we don't actually get caught and collect a lot of money via middlemen, then of course that's an incentive for other thieves to do it too. It was a story in the media, not just in Germany but worldwide, including when the pictures resurfaced. The Tate was pretty open about having paid money. Although there was never any mention of a ransom, they just said it was for information leading to the recovery. So more a reward than a ransom. In terms of museum security, every successful case is a disaster. For the Tate Gallery, it was a total success, because they got their paintings back. London, the British capital and the centre of the country's art world. Accounting for around 15% of global turnover, the British art market is ranked third after China and the US. London is also the headquarters for Amelie Ebbinghaus and the Art Loss Register, the database for stolen antiques and works of art. In its quest to find missing art and return it to its rightful owners, the company works with art dealers, insurance firms, and international police investigators. This is a work we've had here for years that has still to be returned to its owner. It was a theft we worked with the Dutch police on. They took care of the perpetrator side, who stole it, while we're involved in the object itself and who it needs to go back to. The painting was stolen in the Netherlands years ago. It too has been documented in the Art Loss Register. A record of missing art from all around the world, more than 30 years in the making. including works that were plundered during war and the colonial era. The database now has around 700,000 items that we're looking for on practically a daily basis. And we get new items every day. Right now, during the COVID pandemic, there's not so much art being stolen. But clocks and jewellery, yes. We currently add between 5 and 50 objects a day. The stolen jewels from the Green Vault in Dresden are also registered in the database, with each individual element accompanied by a photo and a detailed description. The precious items have yet to resurface, although Ebbinghaus is confident it will happen someday. Some objects hit the market incredibly quickly, which means being taken across a border or two via Germany or Switzerland and being immediately sold. Or they stay put for a really long time and don't appear on the market until maybe 30 years later. Art lovers around the world hope the items stolen from the Dresden Royal Palace will eventually turn up perhaps with the help of the Art Loss Register. 
but years after the heist, the jewels are still missing. The hope is they haven't been broken apart and sold off piece by piece. Dresden police, along with private interested parties, set up a special commission to find the jewels. From past experience, sometimes the state investigators are successful, sometimes the private parties. What matters for me is that they communicate with each other. They need to work as one, instead of giving the perpetrators the feeling that they can just settle financially with the private side and need not worry about committing a crime. Dresden, September 2021. The display case in the green vault has long been repaired, but the loss is still keenly felt. There are gaping holes in the exhibit where the jewels once were. Private investigator Joseph Resch had offered 5 million euros to buy back the stolen jewels. Before long, he received an anonymous phone call from someone claiming to have them. The first meeting was in Hamburg. I won't say how. And the second one was here in Bad Schwartau, where I was approached in the car park. So began the most difficult part, negotiating the handover. Evidently, Josef Resch was himself being watched by the criminals. The man told him to come to another location a few hours later in a remote wooded area. You can't say, can I see some ID? No way. I deliberately parked my car in a way that ensured they can see I'm on my own. I took my jacket off to show I didn't have a phone or a wire. You have to be completely open. The meeting, which took place in 2020, focused on how the exchange would happen. Resch asked up front for proof that they actually had the jewels. The conversation ended up lasting less than a half an hour, and then he showed it to me. The man had a photo of one of the pieces with a current edition of a well-known magazine. In front of the magazine, you could see his hand holding these jewels. It was one photo. He was showing that he had the jewels, and the date was from August 2020. The private investigator was satisfied that the middleman did indeed have access to the Green Vault jewels. The man would return them and collect 5 million euros. Resch then had to wait to be contacted again by the criminals with details on the exchange. But events then took a different turn. November 2020, a year on from the Dresden heist, Berlin police carried out one of the biggest series of coordinated raids in the country's history. The operation involved over 1,600 police officers searching 18 properties and arresting a number of suspects, members of a notorious crime family. But while the authorities celebrated the arrests, there was still no sign of the jewels themselves. The man who had been contacting Josef Resch went silent, and Resch decided to change his strategy and turn up the pressure. The 5 million euro ransom was now up for grabs for anyone, providing information leading to the jewels. The 5 million could be collected by any person who had a solid tip-off, one that led to a successful outcome. But there was no response, either from the thieves or anyone with insider knowledge. The priceless Dresden jewelry was still missing. The Boda Museum in Berlin, part of a group of galleries known as Museum Island, a World Heritage Site. It houses a diverse collection of sculptures, medals, and coins. It really is a phenomenal collection. The idea for displaying everything in one place came from Wilhelm von Bode, 
who was one of the first directors of the Berlin Museums. And because the Kaiser and the State Museums had a long history of collecting coins, it includes a lot of precious items made of gold as well. In 2010, the Bodo Museum welcomed a very special addition to its collection, a big maple leaf, the largest coin in the world, weighing in at 100 kilos of pure gold, worth more than 4 million euros. On loan from a private owner in Dusseldorf, the huge coin quickly became a major visitor attraction. A prestige item for the Bode Museum, unrivaled, with just seven of them in the entire world, far too expensive for a public museum to actually buy, so they must have been delighted to get it as a loan. The big maple leaf spent seven years on display at the Bode Museum. Its sheer size and financial value gave the coin an irresistible appeal, and not just for art lovers. At 3 a.m., three young men came up the stairs at the Hackeschermarkt station just over there. And with no trains running at that time of night, there was no risk of dropping down onto the tracks. And from there, it was just a couple minutes' walk to the Bodo Museum. This is footage from the train station's security cameras, which shows three men walking down the platform, clearly intent on keeping their faces hidden. And from there, they went across the railway bridge, right in between the Bode Museum and the Pergamon Museum. And after putting up a ladder, they were able to enter via a window that had no alarm, no security, and wasn't covered by a camera. The key to entry was the remains of a bridge that used to connect the two museums a protrusion the thieves made the most of with a ladder. The window had no security alarm, and behind it, a staff room. The thieves made their way about 100 meters through the building before reaching their goal, the biggest gold coin on the planet. The display case wasn't hard to break open. They threw everything out the window, thinking it had all be melted down anyway. They then took the same way back via that bridge to this park and then made their getaway in a car. A classic heist. But how could petty thieves seize the biggest and most valuable coin on the planet? German museums have then, as now, a pretty pathetic security setup. Whether it's the Bode Museum or the Green Vault in Dresden, the investment in deterrent measures is shockingly low. There was another case with the Museum Island where someone sprayed oil on exhibits, and there were just a handful of cameras, so hardly state of the art. Security failures that have one particular man shaking his head, Boris Fuchsmann. The 75-year-old Dusseldorf art collector is the rightful owner of the now famous gold coin. It's something you grow to love and is part of the family, a proud possession. A part of my heart is missing, as we say, a major item in my collection. Fuchsmann is the son of an art and antiques dealer. He developed a special relationship to art at an early age. Today, he possesses a collection that he's reluctant to show on camera for security reasons. Fuchsman bought the coin for around three and a half million euros back in 2010. Not long after, he was contacted by the Bodo Museum. The curators were preparing an exhibition called Gold Giants and hoped to have his maple leaf as the highlight. I didn't hesitate long. I thought, yes, I'd love for people to be able to see the coin. Such a rare object needs to be on display for the public. His emotional pain is accompanied by financial loss. A Berlin court ruled that security lapses meant his insurance only had to pay half the official value. Missing since 2017, 
the coin is something he doesn't expect to ever see again. No, I don't think so. It's unlikely. Only in my dreams or on TV, unfortunately. Berlin police have dedicated a division of the force to art theft, headed by René Allange. His office could be mistaken for a gallery, except all the works on display here are forgeries. Allange also worked on the stolen gold coin case. DNA found at the crime led investigators to a Berlin-based crime family. We first had to take a close look at this family to work out the internal connections, who were the big figures and what the DNA told us. That was the basis for our inquiries, and then we had a whole range of jobs, stakeouts, surveillance, and preparing raids. In February 2020, a Berlin court sentenced cousins Wissam and Ahmed Remo to four and a half years in jail. The two men refused to comment on the whereabouts of the coin, which was likely melted down. It's not just thieves trying to cash in on the booming art market. The evidence room at Berlin police headquarters is brimming with seized forgeries including the work of master forger Wolfgang Beltracci. Allange has learned how to spot a fake. If you hold it up to the light, you can see a point where the canvas is really thin due to rubbing off, which is very atypical for the artist. He worked on completely different materials, and the rubbed away canvas always tells us that someone wants us to think it's an old canvas. Allange is one of the world's leading art detectives and has come to understand why art is now such hot property. Art is an interesting medium that you can make a lot of money with. Art also attracts speculators, which is why there are so many fraud cases. But for most perpetrators, there's also this special attraction, the challenge of stealing a world-famous work of art with high security. That's an incentive. In most cases, it's about stealing the object and then turning it into money. Amsterdam, not only the Dutch capital, but also one of Europe's leading cultural centers, a city famed for its rich artistic heritage. People flock to visit the galleries here, most because they want to see the art, but others because they want to steal it. If I steal something, I don't feel ashamed. I don't, uh, I don't even apologize. Everybody what I, I uh, was with in my neighborhood stole. They stole car radios, bikes, they did burglaries. And there is nobody in my neighborhood who said, hey, what are you doing? Octave Durham talks frankly about his previous life as an art thief. He gained notoriety after successfully breaking into the city's Van Gogh Museum in 2002. I was walking past the street, uh, museum and I looked to the right and I said, hey, what's that on the roof? And that, that's why I did it. It was the opportunity. A window on the roof. The seasoned burglar had identified a weak spot. He then returned with an accomplice at night and left with two works by Vincent van Gogh. The daring break-in was headline news in the Netherlands. It's something you have to understand. You have to be in it. It's a culture or something. I, I know it exists, but I don't have the feeling. Durham initially kept the stolen Van Goghs hidden. The paintings were worth several million euros, but were unsellable on the legal art market. Once media coverage of the theft had died down, he found a buyer, an Italian mafia boss. I said to my friend at the time, uh, you go uh, find somebody, and then he found the uh, Italian guy, you know, and he, he bought it. That's what happened. In 2016, the Italian police raided a cocaine trafficking clan of the Naples-based Camorra Mafia. 
While searching the properties, they discovered a hidden bunker. And inside it, the two missing Van Goghs. Fourteen years after the break-in, the pieces were returned to their home, the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. Senior manager Maria Velikop had feared they'd never see the works again. It was wonderful news in the, in the summer, uh, in September uh, 2016. So there was a phone call of the director. They are found the painters. Are f they found the paintings, and they're in the, in Italy as was the rumor, but uh, it was actually true. The story of the stolen paintings had a happy ending, but it's very much the exception. Some works of art disappear for far longer on the black market, some forever, although in many cases the thieves are apprehended. In 2004, Octave Durham was himself eventually convicted and spent three years in jail but his time behind bars does not seem to have reformed him. You have a born teacher, you have a born soccer player, you have a born policeman, you have born burglars. I'm a born burglar, born thief. I don't know, I don't understand. If they ask me, how does it come? My father asked me, why do you steal? I said, I don't know, I just do it. But how come? I cannot explain. If I make money, what I'm supposed to be, what I'm supposed to be doing, so by lectures, doing books, I would not steal ever again. But if I'm starting to get hungry. Little risk, big reward. A combination that makes art theft an increasingly lucrative prospect for criminals. And will continue to do so, fears journalist Stefan Koldehoff. Ein Gerhard Richter für 50 million. A Gerhard Richter for 50 million or a Leonardo for 300 will always make the headlines. And will continue to do so. And that continues to give criminals a reason to think about getting a share of these incredibly high prices. The only answer is to improve security. Having cameras flashing on and off instead of being hidden will put thieves off. Museums need to give this some serious thought and urgently need to invest in the right technology. And that means everywhere. Public museums around the world deserve better protection to prevent them from falling prey to criminals and seeing their treasures disappear.